Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Physique Development Podcast, episode 50. It's pretty insane. I think we should touch on that really quick. I mean, that's pretty unreal. I don't know for what for, but that's uh, it's very cool, you know? Yeah, 50 episodes was, was uh, more challenging to get to than I thought it was um, and I thought it was going to be as well as um, I feel like the progression from episode one to episode 50 for us in terms of quality and like how f- uh, like our flow is and those different things have improved so much in that time frame. So I'm excited to hit this little micro milestone. Yeah, I don't know if I would want to go back and listen to episodes that's <laughs> like one through 10. Yeah, be challenging. I don't quite know <laughs> how those all panned out, but 50, exciting stuff. Here's to the next 50 of them. Here's to the next. And that's literally something I've heard everyone who has a podcast say that I've, I guess, who I've talked to that has more than, you know, 50 to 100 episodes is like, man, I just didn't know what it took to, to actually get to that point. That's, it's quite the feat. So congrats to us. Uh, the, the first 10, I will say, I, I have gone back and listened to some of those. Um, they're not quite as bad as you, you'd imagine them to be, but um, <laughs> they're not as good as the ones now. So, you know, it's sort of like our old YouTube videos. It's like, they're there. Yeah. You could listen to them. Just listen to these, you know, <laughs> this is kind of that. True. It's just that. So um, if you guys do want to go back, they are good. Inf- it is good information, but right. you know, we're still trying to find our flow within those. So, but in today's episode, episode five zero, We're going to go over exercise selection. So this is part four, episode four of the program design 101 series, all about exercise selection. So to start off each episode, again, we review definitions. So don't feel like you need to have this stuff memorized. Just try and stick with us and grasp the main concepts. This will help as we move through the episode and start putting this stuff into application. So what do we mean when we say exercise selection? So exercise selection is simply the exercises you are choosing to perform most effectively to achieve a goal stimulus or stress during your training. Usually this is specific to loading certain muscles or muscle groups or divisions of those muscle groups, right? So different exercises can train a muscle at a different part of the range of motion. They can even challenge a muscle more eccentrically or concentrically, which has an impact on the stress it elicits leads to on our muscles. Even when the same load and rep number, different exercises placed stress on these muscle groups. For example, I'll repeat that. I don't think I said that correctly. (laughs) Even when using the same load and rep number, different exercises place a different stress on a muscle. There we go, nailed it. So for example, the back squat challenges the lengthened end range so at the bottom of that movement of the quadriceps, right? So most of that challenge is gonna come at the bottom of that movement, right? Whereas the leg extension challenges more of the mid shortened range, more of that top end of the movement for the quadriceps, right? So depending on the weight machine, there can be a difference in how something will challenge a muscle, right? So if we're choosing a barbell to do that, a free weight to do that, or a machine or a cable to do that, that starts to really change things, right? So finding exercises that work well for you, your skill level, your structure, your mechanics, alongside your goals is an important factor for maximizing your training experience. But trying to do too much at once can muddy the waters a bit and end up creating confusion around what the primary goal of the specific exercise or program even is. And it's not the muscle confusion that you're maybe thinking of, and we'll save that for another podcast episode. Um, But in each program we write for our clients, for example, we take many things into account, right? Their previous training history, their previous program design, the reps, the sets, the exercises they chose, the rest times, current or previous injuries they may have that could affect the exercises we choose, the skill levels within those certain movement patterns they have, access to certain equipment, do they have access to machines, free weights, resistance bands, you name it, preferred time of heading to the gym throughout the day. So this plays into how crowded the gym may be when they go, impacting our decisions as coaches for their exercise selection and set combinations, right? So 
Choosing exercises that work well for you is not always a straightforward process. And that's why we're recording this episode. And we're going to talk about this in part four of this series. And if you have physique driven goals, a structured plan that is built for you and has you in mind can be a valuable asset. So to open up the floor here, I'm going to start with Alex. Have you noticed that the exercises you are choosing to program for clients is having an impact on how they respond to their training? Yeah, I, I think that the what we spoke about within the uh, back squat relative to the leg extension, our ability to recover from the leg extension is going to be greater than what we'd be able to recover from the uh, back squat because of multiple different factors and, and how that muscle is being challenged. And so we may be able to, going back to previous episodes, be able to train the leg extension more frequently than we would be able to train the, uh, the back squat uh, and also that is going to um, elicit a different response and those different factors. So I think that the exercise selection is going to play a big role in, in, you know, where they're at within their training, as well as how they're going to be affected within the training as a whole. Yeah. And just like the factors that you had just listed, as far as what we take into account, that is going to largely impact the exercises that we choose. And so the exercises that we choose are going to have an impact and we want to have a positive impact on our clients and their physiques and whatever their goals are. And so that exercise selection is just as important part, if not um, more important than some of these other metrics that we've talked about already. Yeah, so Sue, let's expand on that actually. So in terms of exercise selection, how do we start to decide what that'll look like across a given training phase for a client? Yeah. So if you uh, kind of reflect back on what the past few episodes have been, those all come into play as well. Because when we're looking at the exercise selection, let's say that we are doing a certain type of training stimuli, we have to be aware of, all right, like Alex said, what can we recover from? What can we train in? And what is the goal of this specific stimuli? So if uh, it is something that the goal is muscle growth or strength or endurance, that's going to change how the exercises are laid out out. Because if I have someone in a metabolic phase, even though you can definitely do compound exercises in a metabolic phase, I'm not going to have just compound exercises back to back to back in a metabolic phase. Because first, how on earth are you going to recover from that? And second, again, we want to look at what the intention is within that stimuli. So am I going for being able to have more lengthened uh, work or do I need to not really have lengthened work in, work in there? So that's largely going to impact how that looks like for exercise selection. So first is figuring out what the client's goal is and then of course looking at where they've come from as well. So I'm going to throw that over to Alex to talk a little bit more in depth on that. Sure. And for, from what we see from a research standpoint is that the musculature is going to be stronger in the mid-range and the lengthened position. And so pertaining to more strength-based or hypertrophy-based work, we're going to be spending more time in those positions to elicit a greater hypertrophy or strength-based response relative to when we're training in an endurance state. What we're going to want to challenge is that shortened position, which that shortened position is going to be a place in which the muscle is going to be the weakest of the three positions and be very challenging from a uh, glucose utilization or the um, energy that the muscle has is going to be very expensive for it to navigate through in that shortened range. And so that's going to play a big role in how we structure the training as well as what we select from an exercise selection standpoint. Yeah, those are both excellent points. And the, you know, just to kind of like take a step back here, uh, that's why it is so important, right? To go through a, you know, full range of motion relative to you as an individual, right? We talk a lot about that. Full range of motion isn't just, I'll go as far as anything allows me to go. Like for example, on a squat, right? Not everyone needs to go ass to grass on a squat. Um, we've all made posts on this numerous times because that squat pattern is going to be very individual to you, right? My squat looks significantly different than Sue's and it looks different than Alex's, but less so, right? Because <laughs> Sue's femurs, for example, are just super long, right? <laughs> and so that causes many things to unfold and happen down that chain of, of reactions, if you will, on that squat pattern, right? That don't allow her maybe to, to bend the same way that I do and get into that position as easily, right? So 
I may be able to get lower naturally than Sue can, depending on my setup and how I'm performing that exercise. Um, but per that individual, it's very important that we're not just going full range of motion for the sake of doing it. We have, we're full range of motion relative to the muscle group we're trying to train and the goal of that training, right? But why I brought that up essentially really quick was, you know, we talk about these lengthened uh, end ranges. We talk about a mid position. We talk about a shortened position. And, you know, depending on how much you've heard or, or, or kind of into the research of things or following other, you know, other folks who talk about these things, you may have heard that the more lengthened end range elicits more of a hypertrophy muscle growth response from our body, right? It demands more from that process or forces more towards that adaptation. But the flip side of that is as you come back up, that concentric, that more shortened end range where you're fully contracted is calorically more expensive to go through for your body, right? And there's other things that happen within that process, like occlusion into your muscle, um, more blood flow, more substrates, nutrients go flowing into that muscle um, in and out, right? And it's very important that we have the entire rep there to be able to do everything that our body otherwise needs to do or would like to do within that um, or to fully train that, right? So not just choosing, oh, I'm just going to do the end range only because muscle gains, right? <laughs> it's like going through a full range of motion for that movement, for that muscle has many benefits, both eccentrically, concentrically, both th through the end range lengthened, through the you know most contracted position, right? There's benefits to all of those things. So just know that. Um, but to kind of get back on track of, of choosing exercises, um, and that, that has something to do with the exercise exercises that we're choosing, right? Because each one kind of biases different parts. Um, but to follow up on the first question there that, that I posed to Sue, I'm going to go back to Sue here, or if, if Alex would like to answer this as well, um, does this depend on that client's goals specifically? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I think that it is going to be de dependent on the goals that they have. And, and when we look at just simply uh, potentially a, a lifestyle client and what they're wanting to do is that we're trying to be as efficient as we possibly can and get the most bang for our buck within our exercise selection relative to an athlete who's getting ready for a bikini competition. Maybe they have a little less bang for your buck type movements, if you will, where we're doing a little bit of greater accessory work because we're trying to fine tune things specifically the exercise selection is going to look different for that individual relative to the lifestyle client, as well as we look at an individual who's who's dieting relative to the individual who's in a surplus, the caloric nature of where they're at, as well as their training age is going to depend greatly on what type of exercises we're selecting. And uh, if we look at something like a barbell back squat, and we have a newer client who is uh, just coming to us and like getting under the bar and never having done it is not something that I would advise. There's going to be a progression to the exercises that we select for them to perform. And so we may start with a goblet squat and then we may, you know, progress into the barbell back squat or something along those lines to get them more comfortable with the movement pattern in general, so that we're not just jumping into that exercise where we know that the back squat is going to be a great exercise in general, but for that specific individual and where they're at, it may not be the best for them at that moment. So taking all the things into consideration that we talked about earlier that Austin had spoken about is going to be very, very important. Yeah. Context is everything here. It's something that when you're looking at training, yes, there's guidelines. Yes, there's certain things that hold true. But especially when we're looking at client programming, it all is contextual to who that client is as an individual. Like we listed out all of those um, metrics that we look at, all the things that we take into account. And those really do matter. Your, your previous training history, your previous program design, any kind of injury, that's largely going to go into how much volume, how much frequency, how much exercise selection or 
what exercises we are going to select, um, as well as the the other metrics that we listed here. So it is extremely contextual and being able to look at the individual and write down, hey, this person has this going on. I have to be aware of where their volume is. I have to be aware of how often they can train. And I have to be aware of these exercises don't really fit in for that person, whether it's their goals or how their body structure is. I need to keep notes on that so I can continue to progress as I progress program for them. Well said. So let's take it that step further. So I'm going to pose a question to you or scenario to you, Alex, that I just want to sort of walk through. I think it'd be helpful for everyone listening. Let's sort of walk through our thought processes on how exercise selection may change relative to an individual who only has three days a week to train versus five or six days a week to train. How does that change things? And how are you thinking through that start to start to finish? Yeah. So when we look at someone who's training three days a week, I may pick three exercises that are going to be our big heavy hitters. And that's going to be our first exercise in session one. And then the second exercise being in session two and session three, and then probably only having two to three movements that are like very challenging. For example, maybe we're going to have a movement that is lower body dominant. We have a barbell back squat, and then maybe we have a dumbbell row that is going to be kind of our challenging upper body movement. So potentially selecting a lower body uh, compound or, or most challenging movement and then a upper body and having those be our two first drivers and then filling the, the volume from there would be kind of how I would personally go about it. Um, and if there was a, a bias necessarily that the individual was like, well, I want my glutes to grow in a three-day phase, that's going to be a little challenging to create a bias in a three-day phase. We're more so just going to be looking at a full body approach. We may be able to bias a little bit of greater volume, but it's not going to be a, a large significant bias. Whereas the individual who's training five days a week, we may have uh, three or four sessions that are very heavy and in terms of overall challenging. And maybe that fifth session is just kind of cleaning up from a volume perspective because we're getting a lot of our work done in those four sessions. So we're going to be able to um, you know, spread out the uh, exercise selection as a whole a little bit better than obviously we would in the three-day session. Yeah. And also that takes into account kind of how long you're going to be at the gym. Like we had mentioned of not only what time you're going to the gym, so we know how busy it is, but also how long you're going to be at the gym. So for that cleanup volume, you might think, well, why can't I just push that over to the other days? Well, that might be that you're in the gym for two hours who honestly has that time to commit to be at the gym for two full hours doing your actual training, not including warm up and the other aspects, and then being able to do the drive and then any other cardio you have to do. So taking that into consideration, as well as what quality of your reps are going to be, if you have been in the gym for that long, would it just be better to push that over and have that extra volume on another day are all things to be able to take into consideration as you're building these things out. Um, because I, I understand those questions coming up of, hey, why don't I just go ahead and throw it and then do one de less day training? where realistically, it's going to be best to have that extra day training for your quality um, of your session. Yeah, very well said. The thing that I talk to clients a lot about when they're trying to decide, you know, I have three days, definitely, but I, I think I could push to four to five and I really want to do that. And the conversation I start to have with them when they're talking about things they're, they enjoy within you know, their programs, the less days per week we're going to the gym, the less freedom we have as a whole, right? When it comes to choosing exercises, because we're wanting to get, you know, if, if our ultimate goal is to get, you know, improve our body composition, put on some muscle, put on some strength, right? To best optimize that for your situation, especially if you're training three days a week, it, it just lines up best to have more compound movements, more bang for your buck exercises where you're training multiple muscle groups in a very challenging way, almost in each exercise we choose, if at all possible, right? And obviously within three-day programs, you have, you know, maybe we have one or two slots, well, let's say two slots or maybe three if we're pushing it and you have time to spend in the gym to put those more isolation-based, like let's say, quote unquote, sculpting movements, right? I, I don't really like that word, but I think that puts it into context. So right. um, 
those single joint, just more of like well, your bicep curls rather than, you know, having to finish your workout with a deadlift or something, right? Um, but the more days we have, right, as soon as we go to four days, oh, wow, that's a whole nother session to divvy up that volume, divvy up that training frequency, which we talked about in previous episodes. And then we're able to not only do that with volume and frequency and maybe intensity a little bit, but the exercises we're choosing, that list starts to open up more and more, right? Because we have just have more time. And with that time comes more freedom to choose the exercises that may be a little bit more single joint, only train one-ish muscle group um, or bias one muscle group over just a movement that you know, trains most of the body in one movement, right? Um, when we're looking at that, that's like your deadlifts, your back squat, um, those sort of movement patterns that are going, you know, pressing variations that are going to train a lot all at once because we just don't have a lot of time if you're only going two to three days, right? Um, because we want to make the most of it. But if you have three, four, five, or if you have four, five, six days a week to train, man, that opens up the floor, right? And you'll probably spend less overall time in the gym each day with a higher quality, right? And that's not to pressure you if you only have three days. Two or three days is way better than zero, way better. But if you have the option, just understand that your freedom to do that or your freedom to choose exercises as that progresses and the more days we have in the gym, the more that opens up, right? So just, just know that. So I want to talk a little bit about complementary exercise selection or complementary, let's just start with complementary exercise selection, right? So when we're going through, let's say we have plenty of days in the gym. Let's say we have four or five days in the gym, right? So Sue, I'm going to, I'm going to pose this to you. Um, when we're choosing, when we're going through that thought process of, of choosing our exercises, Right us as coaches, we're looking for things that are, are complementary to one another, right? And so when you start to think about how you're programming for clients and you're looking to install those complementary exercises into a program, what does that start to look like for you? And what are some of the more executive decisions you're making on your end? Yeah, uh, it depends a little bit on kind of what the situation is with the client, of course, like we've mentioned multiple times, but it's worth repeating. Um, but it is something of a, a complementary exercise selection where I'll kind of take into account, especially if they're at a busy gym, what is something that they can do in the same area or with the same equipment? So instead of saying, hey, I want you to use a leg press and I want you to use this other piece of equipment that might be on the other side of your gym, being able to think, all right, what are two movements that I can either do that they're in the same area or they can take something over to the same area to make sure that they're as efficient as possible, especially if I have shorter rest periods in place. I don't want them wasting it trying to sprint across the gym and make sure that their equipment is all safe to go. And no one really likes that experience anyways of trying to lock down all these different pieces of equipment. But then it also goes into, okay, what's the stimuli? And then, um, as you mentioned, that complementary resistance profile. So it can be something where this goes into both of, let's go ahead and take a dumbbell lateral raise. If I'm doing a normal dumbbell lateral raise, it's something where it's the most challenging when your arms are straight out, when you're at the top of the movement. And it is working that shortened position of the medial delt. Now, let's say I want to go ahead and work the lengthened position of the medial delt. Instead of having them switch to another piece of um, equipment, I can go ahead and have have not only complementary resistance profiles, but also make it something where it is a complementary um, exercise selection if they're still using dumbbells and doing a dumbbell lateral raise, but we're adding in some momentum to challenge that length and position of the medial delt. So that's something that you can easily uh, be able to apply to a situation instead of thinking, oh, I have to use everything in the book. And that's something that I kind of fell into. And I know that we go over kind of mistakes that we made, but I felt like I had to have so much variation that someone um, would never have to do the same thing or the same type of thing twice. But we can be really efficient within our gym time of being able to utilize things like that um, for the dumbbell lateral raise of hitting the resistance profile as well as making it the easiest 
best for the client. Yeah. And I think that with Sue speaking to more superset based exercises, we could go into, I mean, a, a plethora of different options when it comes to supersets as a whole. If we think about complementary exercises that are just going to transpire throughout an entirety of a session, what we would advise is, is potentially starting your session with something that's going to be more lengthened or, or greater output based exercise. Something like if we want to talk about hamstrings and glutes, as those are going to kind of coexist with one another more often than not, is that if we want to train the glutes and the hamstrings, strength through the lengthened position, mid range to lengthen, we could go with like a bent knee, uh, dumbbell or barbell RDL to start a session. And then towards the middle of the session, maybe we want to shorten those glutes and be in a position where we are um, performing a barbell glute bridge. And then later into the session to finish things off where we've challenged now the hamstrings through the, the mid range and the lengthened position uh, for the glutes and the hamstrings. And then now we've challenged the glutes through the shortened range with that glute bridge. Maybe we finish that session with a lying hamstring curl that is going to challenge the hamstrings in the shortened position. So now we've challenged the tissue that are, we are targeting through all different ranges um, in a uh, cadence in which that we're going to challenge it from our, our strongest positioning and, and most poundage being utilized to the uh, weakest position and really getting a lot of bang for our buck through essentially three exercises for two muscle groups, especially within a lot of our clientele that want to see growth and, and success uh, within those two muscle groups specifically. And something to point out within exactly what Alex just said is that you see it started with a barbell RDL, and then it was a barbell hip thrust, and then into a lying leg curl. That's a perfect example of, hey, I've kind of taxed myself when it comes to um, stabilizing my core and stabilizing everything by having these free weight movements. Now I'm going to go ahead and shorten these hamstrings in a much more stable environment, which is another thing that you needed to keep in mind as far as what fatigue is building up and what output you can even get out of those exercises moving forward. A, a small side note to add to that as well is one thing that when new clients come to us, we may not be programming a lot of direct abdominal work. And in a session just like that, those three exercises, if done properly, are going to be very challenging on uh, your abs, specifically the bracing through the RDL, the uh, degree of flexion that's achieved through the glute bridge, and then the stabilization aspect through the lying leg curl uh, for the abdomen is ridiculously challenging. I remember years ago with Austin explaining and going through and, and adjusting how we go about the lying leg curl, I was sore through my abdomen for more, probably more so than I was through my hamstrings, just from the stabilization aspect um, for multiple days after. So the core is going to play a large role within a lot of our exercise selection, especially those more challenging movements where we're increasing load and those different factors. So be mindful of that as you see that within your, your program design. Yeah. And filling, filling in the gaps is how I think about it most, right? So to expand a little bit on what you guys said and covered, <clears throat> how do we just fill in the gaps, right? So this is where understanding a little bit of anatomy, understanding a little bit of, you know, mechanics can help in, in what are certain exercises challenging, right? So like when we back squat, when we choose to do a back squat, right? We choose to do a back squat. Yes, it does train our legs. Yes, it trains our lower body. Those are, that's, that's, yes, that's true. But when we take it a step further, the back squat mostly trains and biases the quadriceps and the glutes, right? That's mainly what it does as a movement, right? It has some, some more ancillary things, stabilization role from the hamstrings, a little bit of a stabilization and a movement thing from the calf, but on, a, on the whole, it mainly trains and biases the quadriceps and glutes, right? So when we're choosing and thinking through, let's not even bring resistance profile into it. When we're just thinking about what muscle group is missing within that first exercise, if I'm training legs, okay, what do I then need to put in there? Okay, well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm missing hamstrings predominantly and I'm missing calves. Okay, well, let's choose two more exercises that bias a hamstring and bias a calf, right? And that, that in and of itself, the most simple form is complementary exercise selection, right? I know we can get into the weeds with, okay, where's the movement most challenged? Where's, where's the toughest? Where, you know, is it lengthened? Is it shortened? Is it mid-range? How do we complement all of that, right? 
and yes, that comes into play. And, and that's something that I think really does set our, our programs apart when people come to us. And one of the things that I would say I hear the most <clears throat> from clients is like, I don't know why, but this just feels good. It just feels better than the program I was doing. And honestly, it's it looks relatively the same. The exercises are relatively the same, but it just feels better and seems to flow better, right? And to me, that not only comes down to appropriate training volumes and intensity and probably the training split as a whole, right? Episodes one through three, but it comes down to exercise selection, right? And then where in the workout are we choosing to do those exercises? All comes into account, right? And so not only will you feel better during your workout, it'll flow better, but your ability to recover, your ability to go into the next sessions with better performance, right? All come into account and, and come into play and just your joints feeling better. Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah, you moving big. Better. Your joints feeling better, you you hurt less because you're choosing exercises, which I guess we can go into next here. You're choosing exercises that line up really well with you and your mechanics and your joint structures, right? So, you know, choosing to do a barbell press, barbell bench press may not feel quite as good as a dumbbell bench press does. Right. And that starts to change. So Alex, do you want to kind of go into where that starts to, to that decision right there, whether we're using a barbell or dumbbells or a cable, where does that variance start to change for people? And why does that decision start to matter? Yeah, it makes a, a huge difference. And I agree with you is a, a big piece of our programming and why we see greater success than uh, potentially how they were programming before. And it, it comes down a lot to um, their their structure as a whole. So we talked about this briefly a little bit is that uh, we, we are wanting to line the cables up with the joints themselves. And oftentimes a lot of exercises we can utilize the uh rope tricep push down, for example. This is one where oftentimes you're not going to be in a super optimal position for the triceps to get fully uh, shortened or get into the fully elbow extended position that you're trying to achieve. And so what happens is that the elbow just kind of gets beat up. And in the immediate sense, you're not necessarily going to feel it more often than not. It's going to be more of like, I've done this exercise for years and now I'm starting to get a lot of elbow pain or, or different things of that nature, or I'm I'm performing a deadlift and pulling directly from the floor and their, their leg length is so long relative to their torso length being very short to where they're just kind of in this position where if they're pulling from the floor, their lumbar is doing a lot of the lifting until the absolute last second to where their hips are in a biased position to even push forward into extension that they're just like, oh my gosh, my back has been killing me. And that's one of the big things that we uh, fix within a lot of our, our clients is finding their active range of motion and then structuring the exercises to them specifically is a huge piece of the puzzle. So a lot of um, um, exercise execution videos that we review, those different factors is a big part of the the service. Um, and I, I think that we've talked about this in, in one of the uh, episodes within this series is anterior pelvic tilt is a very um, common thing that we're experiencing, especially with a lot of individuals working from home and just having a more sedentary way of life. They're finding themselves in this anterior pelvic tilted position, which oftentimes is going to be um, the, the lumbar just being in a, or the erectors themselves being flexed and then the, the pelvis being pulled back if anyone is unfamiliar with what that is. And so a lot of the exercise selection that we have can tailor them into a better position. And once we have that pelvis in a better uh, spot, what we're able to do is grow glutes and, and grow hamstrings much more uh, proficiently because of the positioning being um, improved and, and structuring the exercises to the individual. Yeah, and that's a perfect example. My dad actually just brought this up last time we were with him is he was barbell bench pressing a lot and he was having excessive elbow pain and he was doing pull-ups um, and not having a neutral grip with it. And he was asking us about like, hey, what do I need to do for my barbell bench press? And we're like, ditch the barbell bench press. Um, and he switched over to dumbbells and neutral grip for a lot of things. And his elbow has not been causing him any issues at all, which is huge because he thought he was 
dealing going to be dealing with a nagging injury for the rest of ever. Didn't know what the um, outcome was going to be. Didn't know what the doctor was going to say. And it was just a simple switch and exercise selection that made all the difference for him to be able to have the mobility and the movement that he needs as he moves forward. And that's a, a shout out to the uh, physique development training club because he's utilizing the the app. Shout uh, out. Shout out. <laughs> so that's a if any of you listeners are, are looking for a way to work with physique development and uh, potentially are not wanting one on one coaching, but are looking for our, our, our program design, utilizing the training app is is very, very pivotal. We've got some new stuff coming very, very soon that I think is going to be extremely helpful to uh, everyone and, and who, who are utilizing in those different factors. But we've seen such great results with individuals using it thus far um, and are really excited for that uh, portion of our business to continue to blossom and uh, more individuals to utilize and so on and so forth. Bingo. Looking back at our first programs, I love this segment because it shows everyone that we too make mistakes. Yes. And we too make a lot more mistakes than you'd imagine <laughs> throughout our journey, right? So it's very helpful in my opinion to, to go over this because people often think, or people often extrapolate people being mainly me as my younger self. And I think all of us, right? We extrapolate, we sort of fictionalize this thing that, oh, well, they have all their stuff together and they've always had it together, right? Oh, well, they know all this now. So they've, they must've always known this now, you know? throughout all of history and time, they, they probably have never made mistakes. And that's just not the case, right? And if you've listened to this series, any of the episodes, you'll see that you'll, you'll hear that we made a lot of, a lot of mistakes over, over our time. But those mistakes, again, as cliche as it sounds, are all lessons leading, in, leading us into the future, making better decisions with each workout, better decisions with each program that we write for ourselves and or clients, whatever uh, you may have there. So looking back at our first programs, I'm going to start this episode with just saying one of the biggest mistakes exercise selection wise that I ran into early, early on was thinking that certain exercises were absolutely non-negotiably necessary in my programming. The main ones being the squat, the bench, the deadlift. What I didn't understand was to look at those more as movement patterns compared to the actual specific movement, right? So yes, I do believe, and yes, we do believe as physique development that nailing down those movement patterns that you go through within the squat, bench, and deadlift are extremely important. But having a barbell bench, barbell deadlift from the floor and a competition-based barbell back squat probably isn't necessary at all for most of you listening to this. If you're power lifters, don't at me. I understand you're in a sport. <laughs> That's a different conversation, right? But if you're not a competitive power lifter, a competitive Olympic weightlifter, then you're not in this conversation, right? Because we need to choose exercises that are gonna get us closer to our goal with the least amount of residual fatigue and injury risk possible right? And barbells, unfortunately, don't facilitate that quite as much as dumbbells and cables and most machines, right? So to preface that, and now that I would say a quarter of the people listening to this have either turned it off or are angry, <laughs> the ones we've kept, what mistakes have you guys made? If those are the similar ones, but if, if you guys have different ones, uh, what are those mistakes? You stole mine right from out of out oh, from under man. me. Um, but it, it definitely is the fact of feeling like I had to have certain exercises in. And it wasn't necessarily that I felt it was those three, but barbell back squat was definitely one of them. And I was stuck in this fixed mindset in regards to exercise selection that I had to do certain ones. And so with that, as Austin had alluded or mentioned earlier, I have a longer torso and longer femurs and barbell back squatting was absolutely deteriorating 
kidding me? Now, not actually. I was having good form and great structure because Alex was there to really make sure that I was executing it the way that I needed to. And not to say anyone with long femurs or a long torso can't barbell back squat. It was something that we had to look at the exercise and have a conversation of how much output am I getting and how much bang am I getting out of this exercise? And is it even beneficial to have in place? And we decided together that it was no longer going to be a main mover exercise that I had. Doesn't mean that I don't squat at all. It doesn't mean that I'll never barbell squat, back squat again. It just meant that within a, accordance with my goals, it, it wasn't necessary. And so that was one of the mistakes. And then the second one was, as I mentioned earlier, feeling like I needed this excessive exercise selection for every single one of my clients so they didn't get, quote, bored, uh, which it, it is something where I know that if you're a coach listening to this, you have definitely struggled with this aspect before. Or if you're a client, you might be nodding the lawn of like, yep, that was boring. Um, but honestly, the boring work is the stuff that you need to do oftentimes. So kind of getting out of the mindset of, oh, I always have to have a brand new exercise in place or they're not going to like it and truly being able to focus on, hey, how can I get this person results, longevity and have them enjoy it and make sure that those go all hand in hand. I agree. Um, the, to come back to your scenario within the back squat, we found that for her specifically, and this may resonate with some of you that are listening, is that uh, she was recovering better from unilateral work. And so what we found is that we were able to, especially with a goal of adding a tremendous amount of, of glute uh, tissue specifically, we were able to train the split squat potentially twice a week relative to her back squat was keeping her in a very fatigued state for longer durations than what she was experiencing within the split squat. Same amount of, of repetitions, those different factors, total volume as a whole. Now, you're going to be loading differently in that, and that would be kind of a, a 201 aspect of um, this type of, of conversation. But that was something that we found within her training. And obviously, you guys have, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously, potentially, you guys have <laughs> seen the progress that Sue has had, and, and she has put on a, a good quantity of tissue in that time frame. To speak on my own errors within exercise selection um, from the beginning is that redundancy. Um, I was selecting a lot of exercises that were doing the exact same thing for the sheer fact of it was all that I really knew. So I may go from a barbell back squat, start off the session with some heavy rounds of that, and then I would go into a uh, hack squat. And then I may go into a leg press and it's like, hey man, all three of these are basically the same with some variables changed. Like we should have gotten more bang for our buck out of that back squat and you could have gone and done something a little bit more productive rather than just continuing to train the same movement pattern and getting more out of the session as a whole. So that was one error that I, I can very vividly remember uh, making, especially early on, as well as the two that you guys already spoke on. Yeah, that that's a great point there. I wasn't thinking that, but that um, is a hundred percent true. Um, and one other thing I want to say within that exercise selection was even just looking at the modem in which I was doing it. So I was doing a barbell, uh, hip thrust oftentimes, and I was really struggling with it. Not only the setup of it, where it was really <laughs> making me not want to do it, but I was just not having the best output that I could. And we moved a multitude of my exercises over to the Smith machine. And it's something where I've talked about it before, but I've really worked on my core. So it's not that my core isn't strong enough to be able to do these weights um, free weight, but it was taking the ego out of it of, oh, I need to barbell um, RDL or I need to barbell hip thrust and looking at, hey, within the parameters that I have, this movement is going to be better in this situation and I'm able to progress in it. So then I was able to switch my thinking instead of, oh my gosh, I need to be able to have the heaviest hip thrust in the whole entire world was, hey, I need to make sure I can contract my glute muscles the absolute best before I'm able to move this forward. So once I nailed down what those exercises were that worked for me, that's when we saw the immense amount of progress and literally went from like from high school of it going from my back straight to my legs to now I'm like, man, I got an ass. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> oh, and with the training redundancy, um, Austin does a really good job of speaking on this quite a bit. And I was surprised that he didn't speak on this. That was like, I thought you were going to immediately roll with that, but I was thankful yeah. that you left the home run for me. Um, <laughs> there you go. So, 
<laughs> so if you guys want, you know, greater post and, and deeper uh, explanation on those things, I know that Austin has a, a handful of uh, posts on his Instagram and things of that nature that you guys can check out that he speaks on in greater depth on those components. We'll link them in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, I've given... <laughs> Funny enough, I, I am surprised I haven't. I didn't mention that. I think I was just setting you up for a home run because <laughs> I think I, you know, think so. I just yeah, I think it's the right thing to do. But um, I have given many presentations over redundancy within exercise selection for muscle growth. Right, so I am quite surprised that I did not. Um, but it, that is a great point to bring up, and you know, to expand on what Sue said too, um, choosing two to four exercises for each muscle group that line up really well for you, that don't leave you with joint soreness and you can get a lot out of them, a lot of output out of them without them leaving you completely trashed for a week. Those are probably a really great two to four exercises to have as staples for each of those muscle groups, right? And then, maybe we'll talk about this in future episodes, but then as you start to manipulate reps and rest, and set combinations and all of that with those same exercises you can really start to shift and change the certain adaptations you're going to move closer towards within that certain training right so it's not that we have to necessarily choose a all brand new two to four exercises for each muscle group every training phase it's that we're choosing these really foundational and choosing these exercises that works really, really well with your structure, right? And we stick with those the most, the most that we can. And we start to manipulate the programming outside of those variables of exercise selection, right? Reps, sets, rep tempo, rest periods, how we're combining these exercises all together, right? So a back squat done as a straight sets all together separately from a leg extension is altogether a different adaptation you're going to get relative to you going back to back back squat to leg extension with zero rest right it looks very very similar on a program but i promise you if you've ever done it it's <laughs> massively different right and it's massively different. going to change it's massively going to change how you're going to load both of those exercises how you're going to ultimately recover how you know from a cardiovascular standpoint how you handle that aerobically right? Your ability to breathe and get output through that exercise, right? You think you're in shape and then you do that set combination and you're like, I'm not in shape. I'm not in shape at all. I regret all my decisions leading up to this point. But all those variables start to change. But when it comes to exercise selection, we want to be sure that we're choosing these core exercises for us as individuals that line up really well with our joints, line up really well with our goals within training, and that don't have a lot of redundancy within them, right? And we can talk about redundancy. I think that's, the redundancy goes more into where in each exercise it's most challenging and trying not to overlap that too much throughout our workouts, right? And I think that's more of a 201 concept that we can dive really deep into in 201 here. But try not to have redundancy, try to pick core lifts that work well for your structure, that don't leave you trashed for one to two weeks and you're off <laughs> you're off the off uh off to a good start you're off to the races yeah you're yeah. off to a good start so do we have any closing uh mistakes or quote-unquote lessons that we want to we want to add to this before i recap no i believe so awesome well let's recap the episode so austin can once again repeat himself <laughs> as he loves to do all right so <laughs> Um, to recap today's episode, all right, exercise selection is simply the exercises you are choosing to perform most effectively to achieve a goal stimulus or stress. Those words are synonymous during your training, right? This is usually specific to loading certain muscles or divisions of muscles, right? Finding exercises that work well for you, your skill level, your structure, your mechanics alongside your goals is a very important thing for maximizing your training experience and your results within the gym, right? And with each program you write, whether for yourself or for your clients, you need to be taking into account previous training history, previous program design, 
their reps, their sets, the exercises they were choosing to do, the rest times, how they were even performing those exercises, how they felt, how they were recovering from them, all of those things, their current or previous injuries they may be dealing with, the skill level within those movement patterns, as I mentioned previously, the access to equipment. I think this is massive. The access to equipment is huge. And this is something we saw change across the pandemic versus people reintegrating themselves back into gym scenarios that massively changed our exercise selection, right? Over that time period. So the equipment that people have available is extremely, extremely important to this whole concept when we're looking at exercise selection. When are they going to the gym? Is it busy when they're at the gym? Can they superset things? Can they, can they pair things together? How hard is it for them to do that? And where in the gym are their free weights versus their machines versus their, their squat racks or power racks versus X, Y, and Z, right? Because we don't want them, you know, I've had clients, I've had clients in New York that have like these three-story gyms and I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that the hack squat was on level one and for some forsaken reason, the mm -hmm. uh, leg extension was on floor two or three. I don't know who designed this gym, but I learned three weeks into the phase when the client was like, hey man, I don't think I can continue to do this. <laughs> I'm literally falling on the stairs. And I'm like, what yeah. stairs? And he goes, my gym's <laughs> three floors, bro. And I go, oh, I actually didn't know that. that that's super yeah. helpful. And that's gonna make me, that's gonna help me make better decisions from an exercise selection standpoint. So that's a massive reason we get photos or videos of your gym space so we know how to program for you specifically based off your situation, right? Choosing exercises that work well for you is not always a straightforward process. If you've listened to this episode, I think you're starting to realize that. And if you have physique-driven goals, a structured plan that is built for you or your specific client in mind is an extremely valuable asset. Now, your next question you may be asking may look something like, now that we know more about how to choose exercises, how do we start to even progress those within our workouts or within our exercises strategically? And that's what episode five is all about. The next episode coming out the following week, Program Design 101 series. It's gonna be all about training progressions and fatigue management, okay? So be sure to return back for that. And without further ado, I can't let us go without Sue plugging our banties. Yeah, so um, first we've gotten a lot of great, great feedback as far as this program design series. So if you have any topics or if you have a series or anything that you'd like us to go over, just a question, then feel free to drop it. It's always in the show notes. There's a Google form for you to be able to submit questions or any follow-up questions that you have from a podcast so we can do wrap-up episodes as well. But if you've been listening, you already know. So I act, what is it? Eek, eek. <laughs> what do you think it was? <laughs> Ick yick. Ick yick. <laughs> if you know, you know. Oh. Um, but other, <laughs> otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, you see my super cool band team. You're probably thinking, where do I get one like that? And you can get it on our website, physiquedevelopment.com, also linked in the show notes. And you can use the uh, discount code PDPOD to get 10% off. If you're getting the bundle of shirts, the discount is already applied. So it is just for the single shirt of you getting it. Um, but especially with competition season, rocking and rolling around, these are great backstage shirts. I mean, these are great leg day shirts. You don't have to be a competitor to wear them at all. Um, these are great to style. We have style guides even. So I'll have the Instagram post linked that we have them as far as how to wear them out with some lifestyle street style so you can look the coolest like us. But that's what I have for you guys. Thanks so much for listening to this. And we'll catch you on episode five out of five on this um, program design series.